FX Medicine is evolving. As we continue to grow, it's important to us that we remain clinically relevant to your practice. So if you know of an expert you want to hear from, let us know. You can contact us on fxmedicine.com.au, Facebook or Instagram. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only and is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line today is Dr. Matthew Muir, who's the clinical director at a fully dedicated integrative veterinary hospital in Australia. On top of his veterinary qualifications, he has postgraduate certification in herbal medicine, acupuncture, Chinese food therapy, and sustainable food development. For the modern pet, he's regularly using adaptogenic insulin sensitizing and pro-resolvent strategies while improving their nutrition and digestive function to address health challenges. In addition to delivering integrative veterinary medicine to his patients, Matthew is also passionate about the role of pets in translational research for humans and how integrative medicine can give back to animal conservation via eco-health initiatives. Welcome to FX Medicine, Matt. How are you? Yeah, very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your history, because you're a vet, but you're very interested in herbal medicine. How did this marriage begin? Look, for me, um, you know, reflecting back on it, it, it doesn't seem unusual at all. And really, it sort of stems from childhood for me. Um, and I guess my it resonated with my lifestyle and, and the two kind of merged, you know, as I progressed through my studies. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, my pets, I had a rabbit and, and some birds and I was, my grandfather showed me the herbs to forage for them. Um, and, you know, that's what I fed them as part of their diet. Um, you know, I fed, I grew up in the country, so my dog ate a very natural diet um, and, you know, had probably probably too limited uh, trips to the vet but it was of that sort of era where you know you only take a, a pet to the vet when they're sick or for their um, vaccinations um, and so you know uh, so I, I you know started with that love of animals and you know started to be aware of herbal strategies um, as part of the you know the books that I was getting from the library when I was a kid and you know from what I was reading about uh, animal care um, then you know when I was at high school and you know starting to to think about uh, you know being able to get into a vet course I started to use herbal strategies and, and acupuncture and um, a few other uh, natural modalities to you know manage my stress so I could, and you know hopefully improve my brain function so I'd be able to get into the course um, and then through the degree you know I was fortunate enough um, um, particularly and eventually with the dissertation that I did in um, in the effect of the, the microbiome or microbiota as well on um, on health of animals. Um, and I went to a university where we had a problem-based learning curriculum down in Wagga, Charles Sturt University. And yep. with that problem-based learning curriculum and also some of the placements that I did through uni, um, and also being a member of the student group for acupuncture. And um, I was exposed to practitioners who were using TCVM strategies, acupuncture, trigger point therapy as a student. Um, so by the time, uh, and, then, and then that culminated with my um, the field research and dissertation into nutrition and microbiome manipulation um, and the effect on health, so when I got into private practice as a vet, it was already kind of deeply ingrained in, in what I was doing. Um, and then that, that just kind of um, accelerated once I started to see a lot of the patterns of chronic disease and also the situations where hands were tied um, as a clinician with how I could you know, come up with effective solutions for, for the problems that were presenting themselves. Tell us a little bit more about this field research that you did. 
Yeah, so it was. Um, it, I was essentially collecting uh, stomach samples, um, stomach uh, acid samples. Uh, sorry, stomach juice samples from sheep, um, and tracking um, uh, and having animals within different treatment groups on different diets, and, and sort of looking at um, the more of the the patterns of of um, volatile um, fatty acid production within in the gut, and you know how that drove health. Um, and looking at pH of feces and stomach acid, so it was quite a big project. It was a pilot study for a PhD, um, and but with when the time came to considering moving further into animal um, production, animal medicine, I decided that I wanted to go down um, the companion animal route um, because it was uh, you know tied better with my um, uh, ethics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so that was a project that I was looking at, at sort of seeing, you know, what diets animals did better on. But um, since then, I've translated that into to companion animal medicine. Okay, and and how did that work in ruminants, which you know the the production animals, largely ruminants versus carnivores, which is, yeah, you know, I mean they would comprise most of the pets that we would um, be um, have as companions. I know there's birds and fish, but mm-hmm. well, yeah, I mean um, do- dogs. We definitely look at uh, dogs as omnivores and um, uh, and and cats as as, um, as carnivores. Um, but look, the translation, you know, is is really in, you know, ruminants, I guess, um, it's very clear the impact that a microbiota um, has on, you know, the function of the animal. Um, and since that time, you know, this is over a decade ago, since that time it's been, you know, increasingly clear in, in companion animal medicine and, and I think medicine in general that, you know, non-ruminants, we need to focus on the impact of um, the microbiome. Okay, so you mentioned dogs are being omnivores and I've got to say, in the wild, when we're talking the archaic dog, the wolf, um, yes. they would largely be carnivores, but I would imagine in hard times and you know, during the winter periods and things like that, that there would be some plant-based foods that they would that they would eat. Sure, but that yeah, would I mean, be in, in a time of famine rather than feast, correct? Uh, not necessarily. I think that um, you know, when we're looking at what I guess what uh, a lot of people would term prey model feeding for yeah. like natural feeding for for domestic dogs, um, we look and look at what wolves eat and and you know and think about. Um, the fact that from a from a phytonutrient perspective and from a, um, a vegetable perspective, if, if say um, a grey wolf is, is hunting reindeer, um, you know, at certain times through the year, mm. um, you know, they are e- eating the the um, ingester of the prey animal, so they're getting you know a rich fermented you know vegetable matter and phytonutrients through the gut. Yeah. Of course, um, the, you know they will. The stomach, like the stomach contents of wolves, um, you know they can find up to thirty different ingredients, um, thirty different uh, substances that they've they've consumed. So they are foragers. Um, they have a lot of metabolic flexibility. They really have an amazing, um, you know, digestive and ability to bioassimilate a lot of different nutrients. Um, yeah, they definitely, you know, gravitate towards meat, um, and you know, it's increasingly shown that they have uh, differing microbiota um, uh, between uh, dogs that are fed higher meat content diets versus higher starch-containing diets. Um, so when when we think about what a wolf eats, um, we also need to think that you know, um, over um, millennia. Um, uh, Maine wolves um, in Central and South America, they actually evolved probably through lack of choice to, to sustain themselves quite well on, on melons. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, there is wild canids um, that, you know, that follow a vegan lifestyle. Um, but, you know, if, if they had a red, readily, um, you know, uh, su- uh, su- supply of meat, then, you know, perhaps, uh, they would evolve back to eating meat. And I would dare say, and I don't believe that this research is out there, so I apologise if someone's you know, put the hard yards in with this field <laughs> research, um, but I, I don't know if we've mapped what the microbiota looks like for a wolf that's uh, you know, evolved to eat um, melons. Okay, that's a broadside one, that one. Melons. I had no, I would never have thought that a wild wolf would have eaten, would have subsisted on a melon. 
Oh, you know, then further to that, though, I mean, when we're thinking, and, you know, some people might, uh, you know, roll their eyes with regards to zoopharmacocognosy, which is, you know, the cognition of animals to self-medicate. Um, and, you know, some people say, well, you know, uh, my, my cousin's dog ate cho- dark chocolate and needed their stomach pump. So, you know, they, they can, dogs can get it wrong. Um, but by and large, we, you know, we have demonstrated that animals can seek out and, and treat themselves, um, you know, with a wide range of um, naturally occurring um, uh, plant-based medicines and, and clays and things within their natural environment. Um, we know, and, and those preferences can change with time, like there's a, a study in Tanzania when chimpanzees would gravitate towards eating bitter roots when they had high fecal egg counts for parasite that reflect parasite burden. Right. Um, you know, that they researched and found that, you know, during times when the, the fecal egg counts were high, um, the chimpanzees would gravitate and eat these bitter roots that at other times of the year they wouldn't eat. Now, that uh, see, I love this sort of research because... One would think that, you know, animals use foods as medicine and then the gainsayer would say, well, you know, when David Attenborough was talking about the elephants that, you know, walk their way into this totally dark cave to scrape clay, yeah, mint clay minerals off the side of the cave, well, that's talking, that's, that's addressing a mineral deficiency. But I was really interested, I think it was about two years ago, to read that orangutans were chewing leaves and rubbing them on their arthritic joints. Now that's a, that's a cognitive that's a, that's a purposeful use of a medicine. Sure and look it um it isn't a far cry really from you know the the thought of how um you know acupun- acupuncture probably came to be that you know um Utsi, like the you know the Iceman in um yes, uh, Utsi, you know, yes. 5000 years ago yes. um you know uh, and the Smithsonian in, um you know institute sort of found evidence that you know uh, you know, he was probably just poking himself with, you know, sticks and things as a, and how people with headaches intuitively kind of rub, um, you know, the back of their heads, you know, which is an acupoint, um, you know, to, to feel better. Um, I mean, lions uh, sleep under bushes that have, that the bushes uh, ex- excrete a volatile compound that keeps flies away. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, um, and orangutans, like, you know, they, they, um, they've got a, they've had a, uh, started to have a penchant towards eating soap, um, you know, that they find, um, outside of villages and they yeah. don't quite understand why, um, they're doing that. But they, the thought is that they could be using the soap as, as some sort of parasite control. Wow. Yes, I mean, trying to elucidate and define interventions that reflect what's done in nature, you know, that's exciting, um, you know, but uh, but nature, is, you know, the more we learn in, in medicine as a whole, um, we learn that we, we, don't, we don't know, you know, uh, that much. The mm. more we learn, we start to think, wow, well, you know, Mother Nature, um, you know, is, is very smart and, you know, there's, there's um, often, you know, a contrarian argument why something will or won't work and, you know, how can we, you know, really try to replicate that um, with medicine. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm motivated to, to you know, work as in, uh, with integrative strategies as, as a Western-trained vet is that, A, it resonates with my lifestyle, and B, you know, I like having more solutions, and, and I like sort of, um, you know, working within a framework that I think that, you know, um, animals, you know, if we're looking back to their, their wild cousins, um, you know, we're, we're taking an approach that might resonate better with the animal, and especially especially if we're using nutritional strategies and, you know, in-feed supplementation or herbal medicines um, that might reflect what an animal might self-medicate with, it, it could become a potentially joyous way for families to, to provide health care for their pets, mm. um, which can differ quite considerably um, from uh, the, the high levels of medicine that some animals need, you know, within conventional medicine frameworks. Um, you know, which would the dog choose, you know, in feed supplementation versus, um, you know, uh, an IV, um, you know, delivery of drugs. Mm. Um, but, you know, I granted that, you know, at certain times, particularly within emergency and critical care, you know, and weighing up all of the risk and benefit, um, the risk benefit analysis, you know, certainly, you know, these tools in medicine are, are there and for a reason. And, and certainly I, I use them when I need to. Um, but definitely trying to always go back and say, 
look, you know, how can I treat something um, more naturally um, where appropriate? Um, and, you know, how can I do that in a way that ideally is very upstream? Um, and, you know, preventative medicine is something that really is what motivates me with, um, with integrative medicine is really trying to avoid the dramas. Um, in previous clinics, now I work, you know, fully dedicated in integrative consultancy. But you know, in the past, I worked in emergency clinics and 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 conventional clinics. And you know, there's a lot of drama that can be avoided if we if we go further upstream with our preventative medicine. I just have to go back to a point you said earlier, and that was starch-based foods. Yes. Now, now, do cats and dogs in the wild eat cereals? No, I mean, they might, uh, you know, tenuously, a cat may eat a mouse that has um, ingested grain. Right. Right. Yep. So, and because if they're eating the mouse whole, you know, there's there's some argument that, you know, okay, grains are um, species appropriate or biologically appropriate sources of, of nutrients for, for cats and dogs. But the reality is that it'd be such a low percentage of, of the diet. Yeah, um, that that doesn't really reflect the the highly processed um, or even uh, minimally processed high starch containing diets. Grains, um, you know, uh, the the pet food industry historically, you know, has uh, has you know built in more plant based um, sources of both the uh, proteins and obviously carbohydrates um, uh, because uh, probably because of economic reasons and and certainly storage reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I I firmly believe that it's um it's not it's it's species inappropriate to feed these high um high carb carbohydrate and starch based diets um and and also you know high fat the high saturated fat diets aren't great either. Um, the main you know uh, you know rewind five years ago, I probably would have said look the biggest you know um you know issue that we face with health overall veterinary human is an immune system dysfunction and and I. I I think that you know is largely the case, but I've sort of gone a bit further to now and to start saying, well, I think the biggest issues that we're seeing is endothelial dysfunction, ah. um, and and diet driven inflammation, metabolic inflammation, um, you know, oxidative stress off the back of these high glycemic diets, um, and you know the impact that has on the the liver's ability to clear um, you know clear xenobiotics from the body, etc., just culminates in in a pattern of hugely unaddressed um, uh, and unabated chronic inflammation. So just addressing that mouse who who ate the grain, the the part mm -hmm. of the mouse that comprises the alimentary tract of the mouse is rather small compared to the, you know, huge amount of cereal that compri that's comprised of, um, you know, the, the modern food that's, that's often found in, in supermarkets these days. So we really sure. need to think about yeah. another change. So where do we get that better food from? Yeah. But look, you know, grain, grain in a, the gut of a mouse is certainly not an argument I'd make for um, feeding a, a, a high carb diet. And, you know, that comprises probably less than 0.5% of, you know, the overall, you know, diet of a, of a cat at the end of the day. Um, and to point out, you know, that's a whole grain. That's not been um, milled. Yeah, well done. Um, so you know the glycemic index and um, you know the endosperm of the of the grain um, you know has a lot of fiber and nutrients and and that's not one and certainly doesn't have glyphosate. Well, probably unfortunately would have glyphosate in in the, in, in nature nowadays. Unfortunately, but, but yeah, but you know. Um, uh, and other endocrine disrupt disruptors, um, unfortunately, but uh, you know that's that's not the same as um, a grain, um, you know, that's been highly refined. Um, that that just translates to uh, a postprandial hyperglycemia, just get this massive spike um, in in glucose, um, and and you know the pre-diabetes metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. You know, these, this is what uh, what we're increasingly recognising in veterinary medicine. Matt, I need to ask you a devil's advocate question, and that is, we know that animals pick up on the minutiae of human behaviour. How, how do you know that you're not invoking a placebo response when you're initiating a therapy like, for instance, trigger point therapy? It is increasingly recognised um, that what we call transference anxiety 
Um, and, uh, and, you know, particularly dogs and cats as well. I mean, cats, you know, have, I think, layers of intuition that are yet to be characterized by, um, by biomedicine. Mm. Um, you know, dogs can smell, um, you know, stress on, on their, um, on their pet guardian. You know, they can, and, you know, they, they can understand, um, you know, intention and healing intention and things. So the lines between, you know, a, you know, energetic kind of medicine and faith based medicine um, you know, and and the the use of the placebo effect, which is you know a scientifically demonstrated effect, um, versus using um, you know uh, medicines um, uh, that you know are within the evidence based framework. I think there is a lot of overlap. Um, and I think that probably is for the use of, of and, you know, as we was recently in the media, the use of antibiotics for, um, you know, the, how, doc, the, how much doctors are still prescribing antibiotics for the common cold. Yes. With a placebo intention. So with with the therapies, you know, that I do, I, I definitely try to, you know, motivate and encourage my clients to, you know, feel good about what we're doing. Um, particularly the other sort of um, can be a rate limiting step with veterinary medicine is, and particularly with cats, is actually trying to convince the, the family that their cat is going to eat this herb in their food, um, in a, say a fussy cat, or they can change from eating a high carb diet to a more biologically appropriate diet. Mm-hmm. So I do have to use most motivation and, and, and certainly, um, you know, uh, what some of the, the human um, phytotherapists and herbalists say is that, you know, having a positive attitude about the taste of the herb will increase compliance. So there's a bit of that. However, you know, we are using, you know, the therapies that we're using are within the evidence-based framework. Um, so we, we are trying to choose things that, you know, if it's a placebo, and it works fantastic because the side effect profile for a lot of the herbal strategies that we're using is very minimal, um, and and the cost is is generally not outrageous. So you know if it is if it ends up being a placebo effect, or we can't really uh, pin down you know the mode of action of of you know a, a therapy uh, like an integrative care plan that we put in place, um, it's a shame because we can't you know easily, you know, generate meaningful research from that, you know, out uh, because of the amount of confounding factors and, and how individualized care plans can be. Um, but because we're using uh, a, a logarithmically increasing evidence base um, for natural compounds, um, we're, you know, we're still staying within that framework with how we, we recommend a lot of the natural st- uh, strategies. And where the evidence is really, you know, based on, on tradition and, and nothing else, um, or maybe tradition plus, you know, a some you know proof of concept mode of action, you know, in a in vitro model, um, and we're we're left with no other solutions. Or you know, another thing in veterinary medicine that motivates me is is when people can't afford to move forward with you know, standards of care, which mm. is another mm. you know opportunity for how I can practice integrative medicine that you know a human um, doctor or naturopath may you know struggle to to you know implement is that. That, you know, if someone can't afford twenty thousand dollars worth of treatment, and there's no clinical evidence base or high level evidence base for one of the natural compounds we want to use, um, the you know, with informed consent and you know, within you know, the code of conduct as a veterinarian and looking at knowledge base versus evidence base, taking on board you know the traditional medicine strategy from the World Health Organization, taking you know all of these factors on board, um, you know, I, I'll use strategies that you know. If it ends up being that it was a placebo or it, it doesn't work, at least we've given peace of mind to a pet guardian that they've you know explored every option. Right. With regards to the individual or the peculiar biochemistry to each species, um, mm. you know, uh, an example here is the dog. Humans can take a vast variety of NSAIDs, uh, non-steroidal mm-hmm. anti-inflammatory drugs, for their arth- arthralgias, whereas many of those are poisonous. They'll, they'll kill their kidneys. Um, mm. However, you might get one or two, like, for instance, meloxicam is con- considered rather safe in dogs. Mm, that's arguable. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm being a little bit facetious. No, no. Um, how cautious do you have to be with regards to natural medicine approaches between the species? Are there some that are certain to one yeah, or the other? Yeah, certainly. Um, 
on the on the subject of NSAIDs, certainly in cats with um, salic cystic acid, and um, you know, there's the certainly herbs that we have to be very mindful not to use in cats. Um, certainly, um, you know, we have to watch what excipients in, are in um, uh, in products, especially xylitol um, for for our pets. Um, they just can't they can't tolerate xylitol. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, look, I think. Um, uh, by and large, a lot of the the systems, um, you know, and there is there is some difference, but you know, and animals can have idiosyncratic reactions, um, like humans can to to, to certain medications. NSAIDs is, is one of them, and that's that's a, a, an unlucky dip, I guess, if if that happens to your pet that they have an idiosyncratic reaction to meloxicam. Um, yep. And certainly, some people have very unfavourable views of that that drug or that drug class if their pets have suffered, you know, a hepatic or a renal um, episode from that, yeah, yeah. Um, or even a gut bleed. Um, but you know, the 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 systems are generally pretty deeply set as mammalian systems. Um, you know, there are there are some differences, but from a comparative physiology perspective, um, a lot of it can be translated. And you know, we now know that particularly dogs are. are Great um, complex animal models for um, for you know translating to human medicine, and that's definitely something that I'm I'm quite passionate about. Matt, what about breeding issues? I mean, this is a massive issue with regards to how dogs are in all sorts of shapes and sizes now. Some dogs have a massive issue with hip dysplasias, others with breathing issues. Um, mm-hmm. What are you seeing here? How do we treat? Where do we place this? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's a, I think it's a major concern. I think that over the, the, um, the next few years, we're really going to have to um, t- tackle this question head on um, as a profession. Um, you know, the, some of our most endearing breeds, you know, the Labrador Retrievers um, probably top of the list there. You know, our most endearing breeds, Golden Retrievers that are another, have some of the worst um, you know, risks of significant disease cancer um, being, you know, top of the list and the cancer rates are uh, out of control in, in companion animal medicine, even compared to, to human medicine. Um, really, really quite um, concerning. Wow. Um, and we know, you know, um, further from, you know, the, the obvious kind of um, issues associated with the brachiocephalic breeds, like the squishy face breeds and their inability to, you know, um, healthily oxygenate themselves. Mm, mm. Um, you know, that that and, the you know, the Love is Blind campaign that RFPCA run regarding that. More insidious, um, and, you know, certainly that, that can compromise animal welfare, but more insidious, I think, is that um, we... We need to pay attention to, you know, our genetics and and certainly uh, looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms and you know um, promoter variants and things that you know canine uh, that dog, dogs have been found to have. And this is very early, you know, um, early concepts in veterinary medicine as a whole. Um, you know, we've got we've got a population of dogs that are line bred. Um, they all look. With the, you know, a breed is homogenized with how they look. Yeah. Um, and there is an argument that, you know, every generation that a Labrador looks like a Labrador, it's more related. You know, and, and, and so we may have got to a, a genetic bottleneck that, you know, is, uh, echoes what's happening in the wild where if we want to keep having these breeds, the cost of, of this line breeding and not outbreeding. So, um, you know, it's that, that these dogs, A, might have a whole bunch of promoter variants that, you know, that are functionally significant, um, that alter gene expression. Um, we might have a population of dogs that their metabolome or, or their, um, their, uh, metagenome of, of their microbiome is is like very um, inbred in itself and, and, you know, gone a long way away from uh, the micro um, biome of dogs three generations ago. And I think that's a, a big issue, particularly looking at the, the allergy rate right. um, that we're seeing um, in pets. Um, but, 
you know, what, uh, so this question sort of starts to say, okay, well, you know, what do we have to do to, you know, make the breeds that we love healthy again? And, you know, there's an argument to say that, and some people are proponents for saying that actually a breed needs to not look like a breed for 50 years um, to then um, cross back and recreate the breed and, and get some of these health issues away. Um, but, you know, these concepts, you know, have their place, but I, I think that probably the more um, meaningful and likely to be uptaken um, approach is, is looking at nutrigenomics and, and you know, upstream um, preventative medicine with, you know, the, the constraints that we have and focusing more on the epigenetic stuff um, r- rather than, you know, delving deep into the, um, uh, the gene engineering. However, you know, that's obviously with CRISPR, you know, that's obviously people are starting to, <laughs> you know, dabble in that, um, making blow-in-the-dark dogs and whatnot. <laughs> that's right. Now, now, you've said a couple of things there that tweak a very interesting point. And one is, just a quick one, are you saying that bitzes are better, that that crossbreeds are better, like when you get a, a Border Collie Cattle Kelpie cross, that well, that, look, that might yeah. actually be better for their health? Look, I think so. Um, you know, I think through heterosis or hybrid figure that they're, you know, technically better. Um, there have been some um, epidemiological studies that sort of show that there's no statistically significant difference, though. Um, so I have to kind of bow down a little bit to the research um, in that. However, um, you know, I'd say that anecdotally, um, you know, myself and many other people within the industry and many, many other um, people, you know, pet guardians and animal lovers, uh, you know, that, that kind of research may, they might sort of, you know, might, might like to question that research and say, no, I think that they are better. Um, but, but the, the, you know, the adage that's sort of coming through, particularly a lot with the designer dogs is two wrongs don't make a right. Um, right. And right. sometimes some breeds that we, you know, we've got a breed that we want to, you know, um, uh, maintain as- like the positive aspects of the breed. So, it, you know, we're going to crossbreed it with another breed. And the hope is that, you know, um, some of the, the problems from bro- both purebreds don't sort of converge in the one designer dog. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. And you, you were talking about bowing down to the research. What's the research on SNPs? This is really interesting. Oh, look, so with, with the SNPs, um, you know, the, the, there's been, and this is quite interesting, actually, and I think the whole um, SNPs in human medicine is, is super fascinating as yeah. well and highly important for um, the future of, you know, our health. Um, there, there has, there were found, not me personally, um, but we have the research that found a, a canine promotion variant, um, three UTR microsatellite um, variant, uh, which seems to affect the glutathione um, conjugation of xenobiotics. Um, and while we don't really understand the, the full um, functional significance of this yet, um, we do know that in humans that like a third of them, you know, uh, alter gene expression, you know, in a significant way. Um, but this one's quite interesting when we think, okay, so what it seems, what I sort of gather from the research is that it's hypothesized that this variant um, may increase susceptibility to carcinogens an effect response to chemotherapy. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, in light of the cancer rates in pets, you know, exceeding humans, uh, I think we need to, you know, go further down that route. Um, I've, I've definitely, you know, I've read um, a lot of the, the work by Dr. Ben Lynch um, and, you know, the, the dirty genes kind of... Um, yep you know, concept and, and particularly and spoken to, um, you know, some some veterinarians in this field, Dr. Sue Armstrong and Dr. Gene Dodds um, about, you know, okay, you know, when you read those, you know, those approaches to, you know, orthomolecular supplementation and, and, um, and supplementation where in humans where, you know, if, if someone has, you know, a dirty comp gene and, you know, they... Uh, you know, they might feel good on or awake on this on this supplement, and you know, or feel sleepy and not so good on this supplement. You know, that's when we go, oh wow, like you know, um, beyond you know, using um, you know, uh, physiotumoral systems and Chinese energetic systems, and, and comparing that to biomedical 
you know, um, evidence based with how we use herbal medicines and, and assessing the patient and, and treating them for what their energetics are telling us, um, you know, we don't really know if a dog feels more, you know, how they feel on, on supplements. So it comes back to go, wow, like when we start to know more about, you know, um, uh, pharmacogenomics um, with, with dogs, uh, you know, uh, the nuanced use of a, a lot of um, therapies um, is going to be uh, critically important going forward. And I think veterinary medicine is going to be vastly different in 10 years' time. Yeah. Matt, I need to ask you about sweeteners. And this is one of the things that humans give pets human food. And human foods are obviously made, obviously palatable for humans by sweeteners. But there are some sweeteners that are quite deleterious to pets. Is that right? Oh, look, I'd say they all are. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd say they all are, even if they, they have no apparent um, clinical um you know, clinical signs, um, you know, attributable. Um, I think on a subclinical level, level um, you know, anything that alters the microbiome, you know, and, and it changes, you know, a pet's, like, potentially, you know, gets the pancreas to send, you know, messages that they don't need and, and you know, have the body more um, leptin resistant and things, I think, is just not a good idea. Um, and particularly when dogs can't, you know, they, they can certainly put on, and, and cats can, you know, put on a good campaign for wanting food, um, but they can't go to the pantry and, I mean, they, they might sneak in every now and then, but they can't <laughs> really go to the pantry and get, um, you know, a lot of the, the processed foods that contain these um, these, uh, these products. It's certainly, I'd, I'd say that, you know, if, if it's like stevia, obviously, I think that would be a lot better um, uh, than moving into the territory of, know the old school um sweeteners um, yep. but yeah you know it, and, and it's and it's i don't think it's really toxic um but uh you know certainly xylitol is, is a problem and that that certainly crept into a, a lot of human foods right now i also am aware that you do a lot of work with um pro resolvent strategies what's yeah. this what are you doing there yeah so look um you know, I, I practice on a daily basis. I practice acupuncture, like some combination of, um, you know, classical acupuncture, osteopathic acupuncture, trigger point release, Western herbalism, nutritional counseling, um, and, uh, Chinese herbal medicine, um, and, and conventional medicine, you know, uh, the, the adjunctively when I, when I feel I need it, um, or when the patient needs it. Um, so, you know, within, um, that, um, what, what we're needing to to think about is, you know, increasingly we need to look at actively resolving chronic inflammation. Um, a lot of my work in practice is, is second opinion work. So I do have the opportunity to, you know, be presented with an animal and their full medical record and, and read backwards from, you know, what the, the current often scary diagnosis is that, you know, facilitated the the, um, the family seeking a, a, a different perspective um, and a second opinion. And I can read back and, and really see a whole procession of, of chronic inflammatory um, or, or potentially like acute inflammatory events through the pet's life. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we need to look at, um, at, you know, trying to actively resolve these. And so, you know, increasing and, and when if we rewind to, you know, my cheeky comment regarding NSAIDs being dangerous, one of the, the main reasons there is, you know, um, the the medicine can become the poison mm-hmm. when we're using um, uh, uh, medicines that, that may, you know, uh, that are like COX inhibitors um, or LOX inhibitors that actually, you know, in addressing chronic, I'm sorry, addressing acute inflammation actually um, stop the process of resolving chronic inflammation because resolvins and um, lipoxins and, 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 you know, these um, these uh, specific, um, you know, pro-resolving mediators aren't allowed to, to do their thing. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm using multimodal strategies always um, and looking for, uh, you know, um, and looking for the synergies that come through with that. But when we're looking at what herbs we're using, um, particularly, I'm looking uh, and and the fatty acids and and like lipids that I'm electing to use. Yep. I'm looking for um, things that promote um, 
uh, nitric oxide, you know, pathways to actively resolve in, uh, inflama- uh, the, the chronic inflammation. Um, certainly uh, paired with the, you know, diet advice to stop the ongoing metabolic inflammation that's diet driven. Um, but increasingly using, uh, you know, TCM strategies generally is what I go to initially um, to, to resolve the chronic inflammation while the diet um, changes are taking place. So, um, and around that, you know, our animals, uh, you know, are under various stressors. Um, so using a lot of adaptogenic strategies with Quathania and Skullcap, um, you know, I, I use the, that a lot. Um, with, with regards to um, resolving strategies, you know, one of the main synergies that I like is um, uh, turmeric and Boswellia. You know, I think that does quite a neat job there. Um, yeah, and 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 then the other probably the big, other big sort of you know logical, and I, probably I think it's so to, in my perspective so obvious that I, I forget to mention it sometimes is is to address the you know the the gut um, you know rehab the gut and address the the gut hyperpermeability um, or what some people might describe as leaky gut syndrome and and you know. Uh, you know, work with the plasticity of the animal microbiome to, you know, um, you know, uh, manipulate the microbiome to better protect the lining of the gut and, and stop that that sort of um, source of inflammation as well. Yeah. Do you do you ever um, favour you know just fish in the animal's diet versus supplements? Concentrated EPA, DHA type supplements, or even I the do. new, or even the new, uh, specialised Pro Resolve and Mediators on the Australian market. Do you ever yeah, use these? I was these? actually talking to a client yesterday who's a nutritionist about this. Yeah. Um, you know, I try to favour whole food um, nutritional strategies uh, where possible. Um, so normally, say say with. Uh, with fish, um, yes, I do. I do definitely like to incorporate fish into the diet where it's appropriate um, and and where the animal can tolerate it and enjoy it. Um, sardines is you know a, a, a major source for me um, because it also has um, quite a good uh, the vitamin D profile. Uh-huh. Um, and and then. Uh, you know, and, and kind of calcium and other minerals. Um, so yes, yes, definitely. I try to do that before sort of moving more into nutritional supplements and and then moving more into nutraceuticals. But it really depends on the significance of the the current um, health of the animal and how far from homeostasis they are and how many strategies we need to use or overlap to to get them back to homeostasis. Um, so yes, I do like to use fish, fish, and then the other problem I think um and and sometimes and, and the other. I think in veterinary medicine that um, I guess uh, your listeners might need to remember, particularly if they're coming from a human uh, medicine um, perspective, is um, we need to uh, recommend strategies that people can afford. Yes. Um, because it's highly privatized medicine. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, the specialized um, pro-resolving mediators and, and you know, really good quality um, uh, omega blends, et cetera, that are, you know, the ox and PCB mercury pre-tested and, you know, um, definitely, you know, high quality with regards to risk of rancidity and things like that. Um, that might be unattainable um, for the pet guardian um, within, you know, what they're already spending to feed their dog and, you know, already... Um, spending on on medicine privately, um, so yeah, definitely trying to to yeah build from a foundational base of of good nutrition um, uh, rather than you know getting too fancy, and that's certainly something that I need to always put the brakes on myself and you know see other um, you know that you know there needs to be often a supplement hierarchy and prioritisation list based on economics and what the pet will accept yeah. and what the pet will, won't get sick from. Um, I mean, I definitely use a lot of omega, particularly in my, my cancer care, um, for sure. Use a lot of, um, uh, and then the, you know, to get animals, uh, you know, high enough, um, in their omega to, to meet sort of anti-cancer diet strategies, um, which are clinically proven in dogs since 2010, um, and recently backed up with a 15 year, um, study called the Morris Animal Foundation study. Um, the Morris Foundation um, animal study where they found that uh, dogs that have high levels of omega-3 um, uh, within their diet, you know, have less cancer risks over a lifetime. Right. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I go to the nutraceuticals when I think that that's the best solution for that individual animal. Now, your work obviously transcends just private practice. You're passionate about um, animal conservation, eco health initiatives. Indeed, integrating and 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 liaising with government and industry. So, you were speaking earlier about veterinary medicine being a highly privatised um, profession. How could integrative veterinary medicine better be supported by government or indeed industry? Yeah, um, yeah. There's a, there's a few ways for sure. I mean, it's. I'd say the, that Medicare would be the dream for most vets. Oh, so absolutely. I've, I've better, better sort of um, stand by my my colleagues and say uh, Medicare for pets would probably be very handy, so we don't have to talk about money so much. Um, but you know, we need to talk about money um, in the world that we live in. Um, I I think that. Uh, I do uh, really believe that um, phytomedicine as a whole um, and integrated medicine really can um, uh, contribute to uh, healthy ecosystems um, and, and uh, um, through One Health um, and Eco Health and, you know, uh, and also through social corporate responsibility, um, particularly with regards to supply chain and empowering um, the people who might be producing raw materials for phytomedicine. Um, so I think that, you know, some of the big line, um, you know, uh, policies uh, and things to consider for the Australian government as a whole is probably the OECD's um, the eco-innovative guidelines to green growth business. I think that's, you know, really important initiative for the governments to pay attention to. Um, definitely a proposal that, you know, um, the government critically evaluate how integrated therapies could alleviate, uh, you know, some of the financial constraints, um, you know, within medicine and, and really strive further to deliver better upstream medication and medicine strategies um, uh, and, you know, increase funding for complementary medicine, you know, and and of particular interest to me and something that I've kind of brainstormed with various people and various organisations is not um, that veterinary medicine is uh, an underutilised tool for translational research um, from a One Health perspective. You know, we have, you know, we did a pilot study, um, you know, that found that, um, which was trying to sort of see if dogs were a good model for naturally occurring um, blood-borne cancers. So they use dogs with splenic hemangiosarcomas, which, you know, the do-nothing approach for a dog that's been diagnosed with a ruptured splenic hemangiosarcoma is, is 19 to 90 days. And, and only six months with um, with chemotherapy. Yeah. Now, um, you know, they used Coriolis versicola, turkey tails, mushroom, um, PSK, PSP, um, you know, standardized to to sort of to test this as a pilot study as to, okay, how can can this be a good model for, for human research um, uh, that can be translated? And it was found that, you know, the, the health span and disease-free interval um, and overall longevity of the dogs on, in this pilot study, albeit a small study, um, you know, were the, the, the longest ever recorded um, for this, this malignant disease in dogs. Um, and that wasn't even the purpose. The purpose was just to see if these dogs are a good complex model. Mm. And, and they are. Um, it's validated that they are good complex biological systems to, to look at a gap between, you know, lab animals, uh, obviously, in, um, in vitro studies um, and, and between humans. So I think that there's a gap where veterinary medicine um, can be better utilised um, uh, as a way for governments to, to, to direct funds um, and certainly to maintain the R&D um, incentive in a tax incentive in Australia to to come up with, um, you know, good proof of concept in more complex animal models um, to move through to fast-tracking human clinical trials. Um, I think taking on board and the APVMA, I'd like to see take on board more from the World Health Organization's traditional medicine strategy yeah. um, and streamlining registration. I think some uh, a major issue, um, uh, especially where there is translational research opportunities or it's deemed entirely um, valuable. Um, you know, dogs, dogs and cats, and you know the can that cancer, insulin sensitivity. Uh, 
insulin resistance and diabetes, like, you know, there's huge opportunities um, of naturally occurring disease in veterinary medicine. Um, and ethically, you know, if, if an animal needs to enter a trial for trying to see if a herbal um, compound, like a natural compound, might be better for, uh, you know, up against chemo as a standard of care challenge or as an adjunctive therapy, um, or as an alternative strategy. The difference with veterinary medicine is that if someone can't afford $20,000 out of pocket for chemotherapy, they may, you know, then ethically having other streams that they, they can enter to feel like they're not completely powerless and to do something and to contribute to research that could then be translated into human medicine, you know, there are, you know, this is where we start to say there are windows of opportunity for uh, better utilisation of, of, you know, um, monitoring you know medicine that's already happening in australia matt muir i i cannot thank you enough in fact i i I take my hat off to your work not just on a patient level but on a professional level for your peers for the veterinary profession as a whole like you're doing incredibly good work i thank you so much indeed there's so much more to cover would you be okay to come back on to fx medicine and maybe we can delve into some some um, specific areas of treatment yeah yeah i'd love to come back thanks so much for um you know giving me the opportunity to share my experience and some of my views matt it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor thank you so much for joining us on fx medicine Fantastic, thank you. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Thanks for listening. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. You can also let us know what further topics you'd like us to cover by contacting us through our website, fxmedicine.com.au, or by connecting with us on Facebook or Instagram.